Uh, thanks so much. So uh, really excited to, uh, to be here uh, and be presenting to you all. I will say that uh, I'm going to say a lot of things that are quite consistent with what Aaron said. So I imagine that he maybe will help uh, chime in with some, some answers or in the Q&A if they, if they come up. Um, and basically, it's just going to dive into one of the uh, specific sources that he mentioned. Um, but I think in terms of kind of high level takeaways and practices, uh, I, I, we, we're much on the same page. So um, really excited about that and a great presentation to, to build off of Aaron. So thank you. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, my name is Sarah Wolfold. I'm at uh, Cornell University. I'm in the Dyson School, which is the undergraduate business school here at, um, at Cornell. Uh, and so I wanted to motivate a little bit um, just to say that uh, talking about Heckman selection is, uh, you know, people should care about it, uh, not just because he won a uh, you know, Nobel Prize in economics because for, for exactly this, right, for his uh, methods for analyzing selective samples. So um, obviously, uh, people seem to care about this issue. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why we might care even uh, more so potentially in kind of strategy uh, writ large, um, and then what what's some uh, discussion around that issue. So my plan for today, um, so I'll be doing an introduction. So I imagine a lot of this will be quite familiar uh, for you. I will um, be happy to share these slides afterwards. And so I'll go through some of the details a little bit quicker and hopefully spend more time on some of the more kind of broader takeaways uh, similar to Aaron's presentation. Um, so what is selection bias? Why do we care? Um, what is the Heckman selection method? And what are some issues with it? And in particular, um, I, not surprising uh, to those of you that, that um, may have seen my paper, I'll focus most of that energy focusing on uh, Heckman, uh, the Heckman two-step method without a valid instrument. So there are multiple issues that could come up with using Heckman selection and selection issues more broadly. Um, I will focus most of my energy specifically on this one particular issue. Um, and then at the end, I'll spend a little bit of time thinking about solutions, kind of really broadly, how do we think about dealing with these issues. And I'll point you to a few papers um, that are quite recent that are, you know, largely in um, economics that are looking into kind of cool new things you can do. Uh, I will say that the, the new methods, new approaches is not something I'm an expert in. These are things I'm, I'm learning too. So uh, I will uh, put that caveat out there. Okay, so um, what is selection bias? So um, I will be presenting some equations because I tend to like equations to help uh, frame my thinking. Um, so obviously, you know, empirical work is often trying to establish a causal relationship. So we're trying to say something about X causing Y. And so you can think about X causing Y if you know, Y follows X, Y changes as X changes, and there does not exist another cause that can eliminate the relationship between X and Y. This is one way of thinking uh, kind of specifically about what endogeneity is. Um, and uh, so basically, you know, X does not vary randomly and independently. So endogeneity, as Aaron mentioned, can occur for a number of reasons, uh, including emitting a regressor, simultaneity, and selection bias. Uh, this talk obviously concerns the issue of selection bias. And so what is selection bias? So the, the most classic examples that you'll see in terms of early literature and kind of econometrics will often come from labor economics. And so they're thinking about um, questions such as, you know, what's the effect of college education on earnings? And so one of the issues here is that, you know, folks will self-select uh, to attend college um, and that this may have, you know, other characteristics that are correlated with this self-selection decision um, and may also affect earnings such as ability. So it's really hard to establish that causal relationship. And so, you know, there's a few things. So one is, well, suppose selection occurs on observable var variables. Awesome. <laughs> you can control for those observable characteristics, get a consistent estimate, you know, you're golden. Uh, of course, in a lot of cases, we may think that instead selection is going to occur on unobservable variables, right? And so this is where you get to a more challenging situation. Uh, and the Heckman method that I'll present in a few slides is one of the ways that you can think about uh, addressing this situation. So specifically, um, so I'll go through this uh, kind of quickly and I apologize, but um, you know, there's multiple sources for this and for most of you, I imagine this will be um, a review uh, from metrics courses, but you can imagine that you essentially have two latent variables and you assume there's some data generating process where Y1 is a function of uh, you know, vector XI and Y2 is a function of a vector ZI. Um, and this assumption here uh, is that the errors UI and VI 
are assumed to follow a bivariate normal distribution. So uh, I'll talk more about this assumption uh, in a few slides because this turns out to be really important to the question about exclusion restrictions. So the key here is that you're assuming that, so, or you're considering that selection is occurring such that um, if it's a uh, selection model, then it means that Y1, the observed Y1, will equal the latent value only if Y2 is above some threshold, right? And, in, and otherwise it's not assumed. So this is where uh, you're imagining there's a selection, mile, a selection model and some of your data is essentially missing. Uh, and so really it's you know, saying, yes, it will be observed in some cases and in other cases it will not be observed. So um, you can imagine then, okay, well, what happens if you don't control for selection? So essentially down at the bottom, you can see if you ran a regression of Y1 on uh, the, the vector variables XI, then you would emit the selection effect, which is that uh, P or rho VI. So why do we care? Um, why am I presenting all these equations? So I think really we care because one of the key uh, ideas of strategy is I think captured by this quote from Hamilton and Nickerson. So they say endogeneity bias is a concern only when firms have some unobservable to the researcher advantage or disadvantage that influences the strategy they choose. Well, of course, if you think about strategy research, uh, much of the research stipulates that a strategy or research resource needs to be based on kind of you know, inimitable and uniquely uh, firm characteristics to sustain a competitive advantage and make it hard to imitate. So it seems like, of course, firms are making decisions based on things that are going to be hard to observe and unique to the firm, which is exactly when selection is uh, the most problematic. And so we say, okay, great. Well, we have this Heckman method, this old method from economics that can be uh, particularly useful in strategic management research um, where, you know, endogeneity is this frequent pro problem, as, as I argue. And so there's a, a, a number of really strong papers um, that I highly recommend to Aaron's point, going back to kind of sources or early papers that introduce work um, that provide kind of concise present presentations of the Heckman two-step method and specifically as, as it applies to strategic management research. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, I just want to emphasize Aaron's point here about not playing the telephone game. So uh, obviously we'd love you to cite my paper, but also really recommend looking at these earlier papers that I think do a really excellent job at talking about how to use the Heckman method. So the, the key point that I want to make though, and that uh, my paper with, uh, with Jordan makes is that the Heckman method should not be used without careful consideration of its appropriateness and of the ability to implement it accurately including exclusion restrictions in the first stage. And so just as a little bit of context, um, and, and I think also reiterating Aaron's point about kind of understanding what the reviewer is asking, um, just as a little bit of background of our paper, the, one of the main reasons we actually decided to write this paper was because of some you know, reviewer feedback that um, particularly my co-author, um, Jordan Siegel, was, was seeing, which they, you know, a bunch of reviewers would say things like, oh, you should use Heckman, you know, there might be selection um, in kind of a throwaway manner. And so folks in their revisions would just say, oh, we used Heckman, you know, in like this throwaway line and, and then would actually potentially use those coefficients as their key coefficients. Um, and so A, they often wouldn't, you know, show the first stage um, or do any tests for whether Heckman was appropriate and also wouldn't have exclusion restrictions. And I, and I don't think, I think it was an issue of communication, right? In the sense that um, there may have been a good reason to use a selection model, um, but there may also have been challenges. Maybe there were, weren't valid exclusion restrictions. And so this, I think we wrote it partly as a caution to reviewers to like, not just tell people to use Heckman if it's not appropriate or they don't have an exclusion, exclusion restriction um, to kind of get everyone on the same page of being a little bit more uh, cautious and careful in our, in our methods. Okay, so um, why do we care? So in our meta-analysis, um, what you see here is that um, the, this was for the incomplete data from 2016, hence the drop in the number of sites. But in general, uh, folks tend to be using Heckman and citing Heckman more frequently over time. Um, and there definitely is an increase in the number that seem to be using an exclusion restriction. So in general, I think we've seen an improvement in uh, methods across our journals, which is fantastic and really exciting. Um, that being said, you know, so a number of folks will have a clear exclusion restriction. So again, I'll explain more about this in a second, um, what I mean by that. Um, 
but very few will kind of justify why it's a valid exclusion restriction, which is what, I, what I'm indicating with the second column here, that basically, you know, do they make a case that it actually should be excluded from the first stage and is, or second stage, excuse me, and it's a valid exclusion restriction. So there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect in terms of, uh, you know, actually justifying and explaining the, the methods here. Okay. So what is the Heckman selection method? So as Aaron mentioned, you know, there's two different types of selection here. So you can imagine both truncation and treatment effects. And so truncation is what we often describe as selection, although selection really encapsulates both of these. Um, and so that's where you only observe the kind of treated observations, whereas the treatment effect is, you know, you observe both treated and untreated populations, but there could be still this selection effect going on in the background. And so what the Heckman two-step method does is, uh, you know, in the, you have a selection equation, which is often called the first stage, which is where you model the decision to participate with a probit model, usually, on individual characteristics or organizational characteristics. And then you have your outcome equation where you're regressing the outcome variable, um, often using least squares on the exogenous characteristics. And then the fitted values from the selection equation, which are called, you know, the inverse Mills ratio or, or Heckman's lambda. And so if we go back to that, uh, that initial model I had in terms of you know, what selection is, you can think about Heckman's selection method as then uh, essentially deriving this, this lambda of x, which is what you're going to plug into your outcome equation. right? So that inverse Mills ratio is uh, the numerator is the PDF of x, and the denominator is uh, kind of the tail distribution from the CDF. And so the idea is that this derivation is coming from assuming a standard normal distribution. Right. So again, I'll refer back to why this, why I keep mentioning the distribution of these error terms in a second. Um, but so then, you know, if you come up with that lambda, you have a good reason to, to think that it's following the standard normal distribution. Fantastic. You plug it into the outcome equation. You've got a nice consistent estimate. Right. And so the key is that uh, you, you can estimate this outcome equation as long as uh, the inverse Mills ratio is included as a covariate. Okay. So um, what do we do in our paper? One of the things that we do is we simulate what happens if those variables do not follow a bivariate normal distribution. Um, and so because that's the key assumption in terms of why we're arguing that it's so important to have valid exclusion restrictions. So I, I, in, this, in the simulation itself, I simplified a little, a little bit, although the underlying model is the same, but I just made the, uh, the, the first equation a function of two variables, x2 and x3. The second equation is uh, y2 is function of w. Um, and then we said, OK, you know, y1 is not observed. Again, if it's above some threshold, if y2 is above some threshold or below some threshold, excuse me. And then this uh, w is a function of x1 and x2. And so what this means is that the data is selected based on a function of x1 and x2, and the outcome equation is a function of x2 and x3. And so the reason that I did it like this is that essentially I wanted to be able to say, OK, you know, we do have a valid instrument um, for selection. It would be x1, right? And so what, what happens if we are able to have that valid exclusion restriction and, and include x1 versus what if we do all sorts of other things that we, we uh, suspect folks might be doing, one of which is you kind of put in what we would call an invalid instrument, which is you say, oh, well, I only have data for x2 and x3. So I'll use x2 as the excluded variable uh, to, to evaluate the effect of x3 on the outcome equation, when in fact x2 you know, should be in the outcome equation. We call that kind of an invalid instrument. You kind of drop something from your key equation just so that you have an excluded variable, which is obviously problematic. Um, so, OK, so what we want to do is say, all right, so let's consider that w is unobservable, and then x1 may or may not be an observable variable that can be this instrument. So what, what do we find in our simulation? So um, obviously you can see more in the, um, in the paper, but we uh, entailed you know, 10,000 observations in each simulation run. Um, and basically we said, you know, what are the, all the possible uh, values that we could come up with if we just did OLS? You know, to Aaron's point, it's good to show the naive results and see how they compare to when we actually instrument for things. Um, versus what if we did things like actually have a valid instrument? Or what if we did not have an exclusion restriction? And then column six and seven are what if we had what I'm calling this bad instrument, which is that we just drop a variable that actually should be in the uh, outcome equation. We just drop it. So a couple of things to, 
to point out here. So this is the bivariate normal errors, uh, which means that we don't necessarily need an exclusion restriction. And so we do see that, um, so the, the true value of these coefficients is about is one um, based on how I constructed the stimulation. And we see that the no exclusion uh, values in columns four and five do, do perfectly fine. So um, not having an exclusion restriction is fine if we have bivariate normal errors. However, if we go away for that, so we, in the paper, we do a number of different distributions here. This is independent normal errors. Um, we see, for example, in uh, column five that not having an exclusion restriction has now actually biased our estimates further away than OLS, meaning we have selection, right? So in this top 24% of the sample is selected. But if we just ran OLS not accounting for that selection, we actually get point estimates that are closer to the true value of these coefficients, one, than if we run a two-step Heckman uh, equation without an exclusion restriction. And it's exactly because if we don't have an exclusion restriction, we're relying on the you know, joint normality of the errors, and that's that we're assuming that that doesn't hold here. Uh, one other, I think, small thing that I just want to point out in terms of estimation in general uh, maximum likelihood performs better than, than running it as two stages. And so, uh, you know, one of the takeaways is we just advise you to, to use MLE instead of uh, two-step in, in, in most cases. Uh, but again, I, I'm going over this quickly, but just wanted to highlight that, in fact, it can be really problematic to not have an instrument. In fact, uh, can can do more harm in some sense uh, than, than otherwise. So, you know, I've shown you that there's this issue uh, I think one of the takeaways is we didn't necessarily just want to write a paper that said, hey, there's this issue with Heckman if you don't have an instrument, so go find instruments, because that's maybe the least helpful advice um, that, that I ever got is someone writing a paper is like, you need an instrument. It's like, oh, cool, let me just pull them out of a hat. Um, so, uh, so what can we actually do with it? I think one of the, the big things that I would want to highlight is what Aaron was saying, just in terms of being really transparent. So I love this quote from, uh, from the Stolzenberg and Ray's paper. There appears to be no automatic way to diagnose and correct sample selection bias. Analytic methods cannot make imperfect data perfect. So I love this because I think it's really, really important to acknowledge that you may not have a perfect instrument, right? Like you, it's just not going to happen in every case. And so our, our biggest piece of advice to researchers is to be really transparent and really clear about the context. And so in particular, if you do think there's selection issues in your data, talk about what the selection issues might be and which direction you would expect them to go, how you would expect them to bias your results, right? Using some kind of understanding of your context and theory, I think as reviewers gives us a lot of, um, feel, feel more confident in the results that you're presenting that you actually kind of understand how various things might affect your results. So we have this, um, you know, this table in our, or this figure rather in our paper. Um, I don't think there's a lot of um, things that kind of that weren't said by Aaron or probably won't be said in similar ways by John or other folks. But um, I think really the key thing that I wanted to highlight here is just the idea that you kind of explore um, multiple ways to get at the results you're interested in. And what I mean by that is, you know, both OLS explaining your results uh, and how they might be biased um, in, in, in your context and potentially exploring different instruments. And so I'll, I'll go through that in a minute, but there are a number of different cool methods that people are using in terms of looking at interactions um, that, that might be worth exploring in your setting. Okay, so what are some of the new things that, that I think are super cool to look into? So um, first, there's some relatively recent work that uh, that tries to test the validity of the exclusion restriction. So just like in instrumental variable techniques, one of the hardest things is that it's really hard to make a convincing case that you have a valid instrument. You know, you can do a bunch of tests, you can try to argue it with context, but it's actually really hard to, to kind of uh, come up with the conclusion that yes, this is definitely a valid instrument. So there are some kind of novel ways that people are looking at doing this. So this paper here basically um, bounds the outcome distribution of the subpopulation that is selected and kind of gives you a bound to say this is the, the set of uh, uh, the range in which you should find results. And if you're kind of outside the range, you might have some concerns there. You could also actually just try to think about, and I think this pairs really well with the advice that we have in our paper about um, explaining your context and what role selection could have. So you can do that both with context meaning, you know, what is the model? What do, direction do you expect the bias to go? 
Um, but there's also some really cool new work that's actually trying to do this uh, econometrically, right? And so this is a really new paper that has a Seda module fixed row that looks at the correlation between the unobservables and the Heckman models. And it's um, basically trying to tell you how the results could be affected by sample selection bias. And lastly, I think one of the things that's really happened a lot in econometrics, and I've seen it less in kind of strategy and management research, is instead of trying to come up with point estimates, they do various things to come up with bounds for coefficient estimates. And so this is a, a direction I think it's interesting for, I think, us as kind of people interested in methods to continue exploring. So, you know, can you come up with bounds for coefficient estimates that are either, you know, semi-parametric or non-parametric, and as a result, don't force that joint normality of the errors? So again, I think there's a lot of cool work there, um, largely in uh, economics journals or econometric journals, um, but I think there's a lot of potential there and, and for us exploring. Um, I would say that the other thing would be cool is that, you know, I, I would highly recommend folks look at John's paper, you know, the Serto et al. paper, um, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that you want to consider in terms of sample selection models, right? So you want to basically as a red flag that, you know, the significance of Lambda alone does not indicate sample selection bias, you know, some of these other issues. And I, and I point that out again, not to say, uh, don't use Heckman. In fact, it's the opposite. It's yes, use it, but acknowledge that you're never going to be able to definitively say this is exactly what's happening. And yes, I have a perfect exclusion restriction. And so making sure that you're transparent about what the issues might be and really clear about your context. Uh, much like Aaron said, is, is I think what, what Jordan and I are pushing for, and it sounds like what, what Aaron is uh, pushing for as well. So apologize, I went through, apologize, I went through that really quickly, but uh, obviously happy to uh, share these slides um, with you and um, happy to uh, reach out to me offline, um, but also here to take questions now if anyone has any. So real quick, I, I, I want to start with a, a question from the chat here. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. In the education ability example, we can argue it's an omitted variable issue and address it by two stage B squares. We can also argue that it's a selection issue and address it by the Heckman selection model. Although they are both two stage, the second stage regressions are different. Are they both correct? And then which one would be preferred? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, so I, I would think, so in that example in particular, it depends a little bit on whether or not, cause I, I left it a little bit vague, whether or not we observe the, you know, it's a Heckman treatment or truncation model, right? So in general, my view is if it's truncation, we should be using uh, selection specifically. Um, if it's a, uh, a treatment model instead, so that in fact, um, you know, we, we do observe both, uh, both folks that you know, went to college and didn't go to college, for instance, we observed their wages, um, then you know, I think either can be used. I'd be interested to hear what other folks have to say. I do know that the, that the stages differ. Um, and so I'm, I, I've looked into this a few years ago, but I don't have a great answer. So I don't know if John or some of the other folks have a, have a better answer on this. Sure. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a good question. And it's actually the first stage that would differ, I think, in this scenario. So if you have a variable, an, an independent variable that you think is caused by something else or is correlated with the error term, then yes, a regular two-stage model. If it's binary, it would be a treatment effects model, just like Sarah pointed out. Uh, the broader issue is if you're running a Heckman selection model, the dependent variable in the first stage is binary, whether or not that observation is in the final sample. So you'd have a population and uh, the DV there would take a value of zero if any given observation in the population is not in their final sample and one if it is. And so it's the, it's the DV in the first stage that differs between those two. And we actually compare two SLS against Heckman models, given those different levels of correlations in uh, CERTO at all 2016, like Sarah said. Yeah, sorry to call on you, John. I remember that section of your paper. So I figured I would let the, uh, it, it come directly from the author since, since you're an expert on that. Thanks. All right. Thank you both Sarah and John for that answer. And thank you to Ting Yao for that question. Um, if anyone has any other questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Hi, Sarah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I had a question. Um, so is there any like uh, rules to in the first stage when you're trying to uh, do the first stage in the dependent variable? Is there any rules to which variables you should put in the first stage? Because um, I'm currently trying to do the, the Heckman 
section model, but like my, it seems, it feels like uh, in my second stage dependent variable is, could be very correlated to the first stages um, variable. Is that okay? Or is there any rules against it? Is Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's one of the biggest things that people struggle with Heckman and, and I, I, I blame it partly on the language of exclusion restriction in that it's actually a lot more similar to an instrument than I think folks realize in the sense that um, very similar to a, you know, an instrumental variables model, it is something that should affect selection and, and not affect directly affect the outcome of weight, the outcome variable of interest, meaning it can affect the outcome, but only through this selection, right? And so, um, and for, similar to instrumental variable techniques, you know, you want to uh, largely, you know, there are some tests to, to try to figure it out, you know, A, is it significant in the first stage? It's not a perfect test, you know, so, I, so that's not, it doesn't mean that you're all good, um, but it's worth, you know, investigating kind of passing the sniff test, if you will. Um, but then also, do you have a good reason to think that, in fact, it doesn't affect uh, the, the main outcome variable? Meaning, um, you know, is there, is it some sort of random shock? Is it, you know, is it something that's essentially could affect selection? Um, but, but in fact, it's a lot more similar to investigating whether or not it's a, an IV than, than I think folks realize. Um, I think that's one of the big uh, sources of confusion in terms of using, uh, using Heckman's method, if I'm being frank. I don't know if other folks have anything to add to that. But. Thank you. Thank you. That, that helped, Sarah. Thanks. I, I, I agree with you, Sarah. This is Aaron. That, uh, so first of all, IV and IV, like, Sometimes it's confusing, right? Instrumental variable, independent variable, but then uh, also when uh, reviewers ask for an instrument and they meet an exclusion restriction or vice versa. So it, the, the technicality of the language can be difficult. Uh, I don't, this is just my plug for, and you said this too, being specific, being transparent. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I totally agree. I think. Um, I will admit that even myself, when I looked back at like a college paper I wrote, I uh, was looking for, you know, it's, I, I found it a couple of years ago for an econ college econometric class. And I think I made the exact issue that I point out in this paper. I'm like if anyone digs, they can find this paper where I don't use an exclusion restriction correctly. Um, but I just think it's so, it's not, at least in my, in my view, wasn't, isn't talked about and taught in a way that makes it really clear what, uh, that in fact, it's, it's a, it's a high bar to pass to find a valid exclusion restriction. So Sarah, can you talk real quick just a little bit more about um, finding valid exclusion restriction and give just, just some broad level strokes, just a little bit more in detail about how we would go about doing that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna um, stop sharing if that's okay because I have um, have this notes that I wanna look back on. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really good question. And so in our, in our paper, we reference a couple of different um, papers that I think do an interesting job in terms of finding of novel instruments. So one of them is um, this paper, uh, Ackerberg and Bonaccini, which is a little bit older, it's 2002. Um, but the approach that they use is to create interaction terms. And I think this is something that certainly uh, economists have been ex exploring quite a bit. And so what they do there is they basically, um, I won't explain the whole context, but they basically say there's going to be endogenous matching of, of principal eight ag and agents in their model. And it's going to be based on unobservable information, right? Making it meaning that it's selection on uh, unobservables, which is the, the hard part. Um, and so basically they argue that in fact, there will be some differences in that matching process across regions, basically due to the demographics of, of principals and agents across the regions. And so if they interact regions, and then uh, regions with observable character characteristics, excuse me, they argue that those can in fact be used as instruments, that those are gonna affect selection, um, but not directly affect the outcome of interest. And so I think there are cases where uh, differences like that in terms of um, you know, region differences uh, interacted with characteristics can, can actually be used to try to get at some of these unobservables. Uh, my co-author actually has a cool paper um, but it's, I'd say his is more of like a traditional approach, which is, um, so this is his uh, 2007 paper in South Korea. And he was using at, looking at basically exogenous shock. So he was looking at this kind of unexpected democracy movement, which actually did come as a shock to many businesses and, and folks in, um, in South Korea and across the globe. 
Um, and then the second shock that he used was the Asian financial crisis, which again was not a, a totally anticipated shock. And so I think, you know, maybe not the most helpful because that's like the, you know, old, old advice of uh, instr instrumental variables, which is like, look for shocks. Um, but I do think in some cases that can work. Um, in the example in our paper, we actually use, um, so we kind of replicate um, Shaver's uh, paper looking at modes of entry in international business. And uh, we use like uh, essentially a, a five year lag variable uh, that, that could, affect, um, could affect mode of entry and not performance. And so I, I do think um, appropriately, the appropriate variables lag to the appropriate degree can, um, can, it, can be valid instruments or valid exclusion restrictions, excuse me, pardon the, the jargon. Um, but yeah, and I'm, and I'm happy to talk more about this. I think it's a really interesting question and something um, that definitely I'm, I'm still thinking about how to kind of give better advice both to myself and to, you know, to my PhD students and others about how to think about these. Sarah, I just said, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm just getting familiar with this model. So thank you for the overview. One of the questions I had is, can you use this for event studies, the headcoin model? Doesn't, I'm not sure if you can. And then, and then if so, if you're doing a time series sort of analysis, does this still hold? I, I'm not sure if you just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I, so I might uh, ask other folks to chime in too, because I'd have to think more about this. So in, so I'm just trying to think, because in cases I've used Heckman, it's always been in um, cross-sectional data or, or pooled cross-section, you know, not in time series data. Um, so I don't know if other folks want to chime in while I, while I take a minute to think about this. If someone has something on the tip of their tongue, I can think for a minute. Sure. Yeah. Um, so in, in my view, at least, I think the Heckman procedure is tailor made for event studies. So you can only have sample selection bias when there's incidental truncation, meaning when you observe values for the independent variable that you don't for the dependent variable. So let's think about acquisitions. Acquisitions would be a good event study. Well, if your DV is acquisition performance, you only observe that when there's an acquisition, when the event occurs. But let's say your IV is acquisition experience. Well, every manager has some experience, could be zero, could be a hundred, but there's some experience. And so you have incidental truncation. And uh, in my view, that's exactly when you should use the Heckman model. Uh, with respect to whether or not you should use it for panel data, I, I think the jury's out on that. So uh, we tried to do some simulations in that regard, and it seems as though it does work, uh, but it, not independent of addressing the panel structure of the data, the, the dependency between the error term. So you almost have to generate an inverse Mills ratio and then throw it into a, a fixed or random effects model or, or whatever you're doing to, to address that, that IID observation violation. Hopefully that's helpful. Hopefully that, and that's super helpful because um, yeah, my work is in MA, so that was a great example. Thank you oh, so much. Yeah. yeah anytime. You. Yeah. Thanks, John. That that was uh, that's, that's super helpful. Yeah. So I was thinking because I guess I was thinking of like more the the time series nature, which is where I was getting caught up. But yeah, I totally agree with his advice in terms of MAs because like essentially that's what you know Shaver does, and he's the he's, that's a great paper to look at in terms of it really introduced Heckman into the strategy literature. So it's Shaver, nineteen ninety eight. Um, and so really what he's looking at there is essentially, you know, an event, right? He's looking at entry, uh, entry mode into a country, so. So John, uh, one thing I took from both uh, the Simadini paper before yours and, and then your paper with, with Travis is, uh, you know, no method's perfect and Sarah emphasized this, but if you analyze it one way and it works and you analyze it another way and it works and you analyze it another way and it works, you know, it may be imperfect, but at least you're accumulating evidence. So I don't know if I don't know if you agree with that, but I've taken that out of your paper and said, okay, well, I, why don't I show them three different ways that all work and say, hey, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, I totally agree. We 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 uh, in our our main conclusion is like, you know, researchers need to triangulate approaches. Basically, if you you know if, if you don't have that perfect data, so that means like both with qualitative context as well as you know trying different instruments or showing the base and the naive estimate, as you said, Aaron and you know, and really trying to make sense and, and being clear, okay, here's how it differed from the naive estimate and here's why. Uh, when we introduce a second instrument, here's how it differed from just using one instrument. Here's why, you know, to try to get a sense that here's the range of estimates that we think are appropriate. And we may not be able to say, yes, the point estimate is 6.72, 
Um, but we can feel confident that it's, you know, between six and 10 or, or whatever, you know, whatever you're able to come from. I think that's important that, 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 that that's a valid and accepted way to talk about our data and our conclusions. Great. Thank you guys for all chiming in on that. We've got uh, another question here in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, read this out. So it's just a small clarification question um, for the treatment effects, not the sample selection. Would you say it's better to use a treatment effects analysis using various matching techniques like the nearest neighbor approach? Um, or uh, this person feels that there are fewer assumptions required than the Heckman selection technique in that particular instance. So, yeah, um, a, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, yeah, so I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, so I, cer certainly in our, um, in our paper, one of the things that we do talk is that there are cases where um, various matching techniques um, are appropriate in terms of treatment models. So, um, you know, certainly in general, you're going to think that uh, one of the key, I don't want to say issues, but one of the key assumptions of, of most matching models to some extent is, you know, that you can match on observables, right? And that the observables will capture whatever you can't, whatever you can't observe, right? So if, if the unobservables uh, differ in a way that kind of can't be captured, if you will, or can't be matched on in on observables, then you still have the issue of not really dealing with the selection uh, because that's not where the selection occurred on, or the, excuse me, the treatment occurred on. Um, that being said, I, I totally agree. You know, I think matching models are really compelling. They're interesting. You know, you can match on a number of different characteristics. And so I, I'm not to say don't use it. I, I would advocate using them as one part of your triangulation approach if you're in a treatment model, which is to say, you, you show what happens with matching, what the observables that you're able to match on. Uh, you show what the Heckman method is. Maybe you have a variable that you think is an appropriate exclusion restriction um, and, and maybe not. Uh, and seeing how those estimates compare, I think being really transparent and in using multiple approaches is not inappropriate if you think it's possible you have matching on observables. Yeah, that, that question was from me. Uh, so, so basically, uh, what I what I'm uh, trying to understand is uh, like when we are matching, it's very easy to have a covariate balance table and then the graphs to really it becomes very very uh, appealing and very very uh, uh, compelling evidence. I mean, we can see how good the matching is. But finding a proper instrument and then finding the exclusion restriction. I mean. We, we, uh, I feel we are getting into more complications rather complications rather than solving them. That's why I, I wanted to understand. The sample selection cannot be uh, cannot be uh, done with uh, treatment effects, of course, uh, with with the matching. But when we are in the treatment effects domain, would you say that uh, perhaps uh, matching using uh, let's say nearest neighbor or the uh, course and exact uh, techniques? Uh, might be slightly preferred because the number of assumptions seem to be lower and matching. One assumption, as you rightly point out, is is the matching on observables. That's taken. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I I I am a big fan of matching. I, I took a class with Gary King, who's like all about matching at, at Harvard, um, and so I love it. It's you know, it's super clear. It's presented really well. I think you can make a really compelling case. Um, and so I'm a big fan of using matching models. Um, However, I'm also a big fan of Heckman and I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I understand that you need to pick like one maybe that you're gonna focus on more, right? And so I think really which one you focus on more depends on how well you think the matching is gonna work. And that, on, uh, that fundamentally relies on where you think selection is or treatment, excuse me, is, uh, is occurring on, right? So if you think you, uh, it's not occurring in a way that means that your matching is going to basically be totally invalid, then yeah, go for it. You know, you can conclude Heckman as a robustness. That's totally fine. I, I think I don't want to say that you shouldn't do that um, or not include Heckman at all if you think that it, you know, that the errors aren't normal and you don't have an exclusion restriction. Um, but I think it's worth investigating, you know, if you've done a good job with matching and uh, you know, there's there's high likelihood they may be similar anyways, and then you're gonna, you know. Uh, also dispel any folks, reviewers who say, hey, what happens with selection models? What if you have selection on observables? Because I do find that uh, at least in the, I have one paper with matching and I do get that a lot uh, is people, folks saying like, what about selection on observables? Uh, so I would just put that out as a, as a caveat, but yeah, I'd say, I think it's a great model to use. I, I don't know how others feel, but. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we've got time for one more question if anyone has a question they'd like to get in. All right, Sarah, I think you left them speechless again. So <laughs> it must be the cool glasses. So <laughs> fantastic. No, I, I love what came out uh, about the triangulation and really understanding that uh, a totality of evidence uh, really gives us as authors further confidence in our prediction and results, but also re for reviewers and the, just the field in general. So uh, I love that that came out in this session. So thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to go ahead. Let's give her a virtual round of applause.